Ladies and gentlemen, in the name of Boston College, I'm pleased to welcome you here, especially our honored guest and uh, for the lecture. This is under the sponsorship also of Christian Solidarity International, and there is no better person than to introduce our distinguished guest than John Eibner from that organization. John, please. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. I'd like to uh, start with an expression of gratitude to Michael and Frank Salome and all of the co-sponsors for making this event here at Boston College possible this evening. In January 2011, just as the Arab Spring uprisings were getting uh, underway in Tunisia, and long before the Islamic State or ISIS or Daesh, however you want to call it, was making the headlines, the former president of Lebanon, Amin Jamal, declared in Beirut before the international media, Massacres are taking place against Christians for no reason and without justification. What is happening to the Christians is genocide. Within a week, the French president, Nicolas uh, Sarkozy, echoed that view. In his assessment, it is, we cannot accept and thereby facilitate what looks more and more like a particularly perverse program of religious cleansing in the Middle East. At the time, these prophetic warnings failed to gain political traction. They were drowned out by the powerful, upbeat, Arab, Arab Spring messaging of American public diplomacy. Over the past four years, mounting sectarian violence in the Middle East has not spared any religious community but in the case of the region's Christians and other religious minorities, the violence poses an existential threat. It is now conceivable that within a generation, the historic Christian communities of the Arab majority Middle East will have all but vanished, not only in Iraq and Syria where the crisis is most acute today, but also in Lebanon and Egypt should order break down there too. The US government only recently, and albeit in hushed tones, accepted the validity of President Jamal's warning. Earlier this month at the UN in Geneva, Washington quietly joined Russia and over 60 other non-Muslim states in acknowledging that the survival of Christians in the Middle East is now seriously threatened. Furthermore, only in two days' time, this Friday, with the agreement of both Washington and Moscow, the UN Security Council will have this issue on the agenda for the very first time. Tonight, it's a special honor for me to introduce the elder statesman who sounded the first lonely warning about the potential eradication of Christians from the Middle East. His Excellency Sheikh Amin Jamal served as president of Lebanon from 1982 until 1988. President Jamal's term in office, indeed his entire political career, has been dedicated to preserving Lebanon's sovereignty and its historic religious pluralism on the basis of mutual respect of religious communities and on common citizenship. This evening he will speak on religious pluralism in the Middle East, a challenge for the international community. And let us give a very warm welcome to President Jamal. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, Dr. Ebner. Thank you for attending this uh, conference. It's indeed a privilege to be with you here at uh, Boston College, a great institution of learning. I would like to thank the college and its various units uh, which have co-sponsored tonight's proceedings. And I must also thank my dear friend, John Eibner, and his dedicated colleagues at Christian Solidarity International 
for all they have done to uphold the principle of religious freedom and to protect the dignity and lives of those threatened because of their faith. It's no mere coincidence that the CSI and Dr. Eibner are discussed and quoted at length in a major report entitled The Real War of Christianity, published this month in the influential magazine Foreign Policy. Before sharing the substance of my remarks, I must also acknowledge my long-standing personal connections to the city of Boston, which over the years has served as a kind of intellectual refuge for me and a very welcome one. From my, pers for, from my perspective, I have been asked to speak on the critical theme of religious pluralism in the Middle East as a challenge to the international community. If I may be permitted, I would like to take a few moments to define terms and provide context. First, I will speak about religious pluralism rather than religious freedom. Freedom implies the right of individuals to decide on matters of faith for themselves and even to, to change or give up their religion. In the present Middle East climate, both religious pluralism and religious freedom are important issues and both face mounting obstacles. Nevertheless, I believe that under present conditions in which pluralism is under daily assault, we must start by doing everything possible to safeguard religious pluralism. Because this region is the birthplace of three faiths upholding religious pluralism is a sacred task. Next, when I say Middle East, I mean primarily the Arab world countries of this region, or what is often called the Arab world. This world really is a remarkable mosaic of religions, ethnicities, and cultures. Also, I employ the phrase international community in a broad sense to cover states as well as non-state actors, most especially religious institutions and civil society organizations. Finally, I must stress the following point. I speak tonight as a former head of state from a country, Lebanon, where Christians have always played a leading political and cultural role. I am myself a Christian, and we have convened at Boston College a Christian-run institution under the auspices of Christian Solidarity International. For those reasons, I make no apologies for focusing my remarks on the extreme plight of Arab Christians. At the same time, when discussing the crisis of pluralism in the Middle East, this fact must be understood above all if Christians are among the first victims of persecutions, they are by no means the sole victims of persecution. Within a Middle East environment that features a steadily contracting space for pluralism, religious extremists oppress and even kill anyone who does not submit blindly to their authority as whole. Well. They murder Shia, Sunni, Druze, Alawites, and more. In short, they kill the other, meaning virtually everyone. The crisis of Christianity in the Arab world. I condemn, I condemn all forms of persecution, no matter who is targeted. But the Christian dimension of the crisis of pluralism is worthy of particular attention because it carries special and tragic implications for civilization. <coughs> this is because even under the worst case scenarios, there is absolutely no danger that the Middle East will lose its Muslim character. In contrast, in present negative trends, if negative 
trends continue to intensify, we must start thinking about the unthinkable, namely the extinction of Christianity in the region. We should all care about the possible disappearance of Christianity from the Middle East. Not only because of the human toll this process is imposing, but also because it will destabilize the region for generations and perhaps permanently. In this regard, a former researcher with Human Rights Watch recently warned of the end of Christianity in the Middle East, where its presence has often served as a bulwark against fanaticism. If Christianity were distinguished in the Middle East, then we would also need to alter the very lexicon we use to describe the region. In 2011, the Lebanese scholar Kamal Salibi noted that, and I quote, it is the Christian Arabs who keep the Arab word Arab rather than Muslim. Having indicated the dire consequences of the collapse of religious pluralism in the Middle East, a few words need to be said about the nature of the crisis of pluralism. The essence of this crisis is not difficult to grasp and is revealed in the word in the words used to describe the latest atrocities in Iraq and Syria, massacre, execution, beheading, crucifixion, murder, rape, sexual slavery, etc. Witnessing these conditions, serious is conspect observers have corrected, correctly raised the specter of genocide. Earlier this month, for example, the Vatican's representative in Geneva issued an extraordinary call for the creation of a UN-approved multilateral, multilateral force to stop genocide. This is the word he used, genocide, against Christians and other groups. Just last week, human rights investigators with the United Nations accused ISIS of committing acts of genocide against the Yazidis in northern Iraq. And here I should mention the work of Christian Solidarity International, which years ago had the, fors the foresight to circulate a genocide warning, alerting the world to the Im impending fate of religious minorities in the Middle East. From my personal perspective, I am a native and lifelong resident of a small country that for better or worse, absorb every imaginable Arab, Middle Eastern, and global trend. I have been a close student and a part, and a, of, in, of and participant in Middle Eastern politics on the national and regional levels for well over half a century. I have served in government as a peacetime parliamentarian and wartime president. <laughs> I have directed an international think tank and one of the Arab world's oldest political parties. In all of these capacities, I have traveled extensively and visited almost every country in the Middle East sub numerous times over many decades. Given the arc of my career, I am deeply saddened to report that I have never in my political life, witnessed Arab Christians in such extreme danger. For my community, 2014 truly was an annus horribilis, a year of ex existential crisis. Designating 2014 as a disastrous year for the Middle Eastern Christians is doubly disturbing given that their numbers were steadily dwindling even before the rise of ISIS. According to estimates that predate the Islamic State and all its horrors, at the beginning of the 20th century, Christians constituted approximately 20% of the total population of the Middle East. 
Today, that figure has been reduced to less than 5%. The persecution of Christians is often blamed on the conditions created by the occupation of Iraq in 2003 by the United States. Although the, reverber the reverberations of the Iraq war have certainly hit Arab Christians particularly hard, it should be remembered that in the last two decades of the 20th century, that is, during the period ending just before the 2003 Iraq War, it is estimated, it, it is estimated that about 2 million Christians left the Middle East to settle in Europe, the Americas, and other regions, it means before the Iraqi War. 2 million Christians left the area. Projecting current population trends forward. The Middle East remaining 12 million Christians may be reduced by 50% in less than a decade. Given the long-term and immediate catastrophes that have befallen Arab Christians, it is inexplicable how little attention they have received from the media, national and national policy makers. Regarding this trend, or non-trend, or the opposite trend, two years ago, the respected journalist Jeffrey Goldberg said that persecution of Arab Christians is, and I quote, one of the most undercovered stories in international news. We don't know why, but there is a kind of blackout concerning those events, or those massacres of this policy. And despite the most recent bloodshed, not, mass, not much has changed. In fact, the foreign policy article I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks amply documents with its, what it calls Washington's passivity in the face of an ongoing wave of atrocities against the Assyrian Chaldean and other Christian community of Iraq and Syria. I would like to place atrocities in a human context by focusing on the case of the, of the Christian town of Malula, Syria, occupied by one of the Al-Qaeda splinter groups. There, the town's ancient and historic church was completely demolished and its Christian residents, including a community of nuns, were forced to flee for their lives. In the wake of all such attacks, the response by the United States has been a resounding non-response. We have seen, for instance, failure by the, by the White House to name an incumbent to the newly created position of special envoy for Christians and other groups under assault by ISIS. Failure by the US military to deploy warplanes to protect internally displaced Christians in Iraq. And failure by executive branch officials and members of Congress even to speak up on behalf of targeted Christians. Every reasonable critic, myself included, must recognize that the United States is constantly buffeted by demands that it do more to intervene in crises around the world. And so, even as we criticize the US, we must recognize its numerous and significant contribution as a force for good. The United States, for instance, has been a key supporter of the beleaguered Lebanese armed forces which represent the last best hope of democratic Lebanon. Yet, as we witness Christianity disappearing from the Middle East mosaic, appealing to the United States, it's logical because it has the military means to do more. The US is also politically positioned to act if it has the will, thanks to its strong relationships with regional governments and leading position within the United Nations. 
What must be done? Military and diplomatic measures. If I may be permitted to do so, I would like to canvas options for aiding Arab Christians and other minorities. These options include policies that could be pursued by states unilaterally, bilaterally, and multilaterally. What I think the international community must consider, first and foremost, is creating a region-wide strategy for dealing with the Middle East crisis of pluralism. And by international community, what I really mean is the leading democracies of Europe and North America. As early as 2011, Dr. Eibner offered a wise proposal that is even more necessary today. He urged President Obama to, and I quote, establish a high-level interagency task force within the U.S. government to prepare a strategy aimed at securing religious freedom and diversity in the Middle East. Do you remember that? Without a well-conceived plan to secure religious pluralism over the long term, this critical goal will almost certainly be lost amid the confused and confusing welter of problems and crises that the Middle East has become. Without a well-conceived plan to secure religious pluralism over the long term, this critical goal will almost certainly be lost amid the confused and confusing welter of problem, problems and crises that the Middle East has become. Previously, I mentioned the call by the Vatican's representative in Geneva for the creation of the UN-endorsed military force to combat ISIS. It's surely the case that the Islamic State will only be contained and then destroyed if it is subjected to sustained military attack. We must remember how well equipped ISIS is, thanks to its capture of equipment and heavy weapons from Iraqi and Syrian government arsenals its control of oil fields, its funding by wealth by naive Muslim supporters, and its rampant criminality, including bank robberies, kidnappings, and extortion. It helps ISIS constitute a real force, military and financial force, strengths. You must remember how well equipped ISIS is Beyond military operations, the United, the United States and other leading, leading powers should activate diplomatic channels to assist Arab Christian communities. Such diplomatic measures could include the creation of a group, contact group at the UN headquarters, which, if properly staffed, could collect information and encourage policy response, not only by UN agencies and individual UN members, but also by other multilateral organizations, such as the Arab League, the Gulf Cooperation Council, and the various Arab and international development funds. Hopefully, the seed for a new integrated diplomatic approach will be planted later this week, when the French Foreign Minister is scheduled to share a UN Security Council session devoted to the plight of Christians in the Middle East. A surge of diplomacy on behalf of Arab Christians and other endangered groups could be guided by a document circulated by the Vatican, Russia, and Lebanon entitled Supporting the Human Rights of Christians and Other Communities. This is the first official paper of this topic to be submitted to the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Adroit diplomacy would mean working tandem with diplomats and religious and political leaders from, from majority Muslim countries. For example, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zayed Raad al Hussein, himself a Muslim and a member of the Jordanian royal family, has strongly condemned ISIS and has done 
so by invoking widely accepted Muslim teachings. Similar declarations against religious extremism and the persecution of non-Muslims have been voiced by leading Muslims such as His Royal Highness King Salman of Saudi Arabia, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi of Egypt, Grand Imam Ahmed al tayyib of Egypt's Al-Azhar University, former Prime Minister of Lebanon, Saad Hariri, and the Grand Imam of, Be of Beirut, Abdel Latif Darian. Among the important declarations by Muslim authorities in support of non-Muslims, the following two statements particularly gratified me. In late 2013, His Royal Highness King Abdullah II of Jordan said, the protection, and it's very important, the protection of the rights of Christians is a duty rather than a favor. Christians have always played a key role in building our societies and defending our nations. And in September of last year, following the lightning rise of ISIS and its reign of terror, the rector of the largest mosque in Paris, Dalil Boubaker, declared, we are all, no matter our religion, we are all Christians of the Middle East. These strong voices that have spoken in favor of religious pluralism are the true Muslims and the genuine defenders of Islam. Now is the time to bring together these sentiments and distill them into a comprehensive plan of action. They should act, not only speak. The forum for such an effort already exists in Vienna, namely the International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue, founded by the late King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia in 2011. To better engage institutions such as ICIID, the United States and its European allies should perhaps consider retraining and repositioning their diplomatic corps to address with greater skill issues of religious faith. What must be done on regional, the regional safe havens? I would like to focus for a moment on a proposal which has received some attention, the creation of safe havens in which targeted communities could enjoy temporary residency, thus allowing them to remain within their home countries. Among others, the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, the most reverend Justin, Justin Welby, has advocated such an approach. In country safe havens, as alternative to refuge abroad to offer certain could offer certain advantages. After conditions stabilize, safe havens would enable Christians to return to their home communities far more rapidly than if they, if they were abroad. However, the placement and conditions and of proposed safe havens need to be considered with extreme care. There must be a sufficiently strong local force to provide on the ground security. And this force will need logical and air support provided by international partners who enjoy the legal authority and political will to act swiftly and decisively. In considering the establishment of protected, zone, protected zones, we must recall the tragic fate of the United States, the United Nations safe area in Srebrenica, Bosnia, created in April 1993 but overrun a little more than two years later, resulting in the massacre of more than 8,000 Muslims at the hands of Serb paramilitaries. After establishing the necessary background conditions, including international military guarantees, it might be possible to create an officially declared safe haven for Christians and other groups in the Nineveh Plains region of northern Iraq. Historically, this region has been a bedrock of Christianity and its Christian residents have for centuries lived in harmony with their Muslim neighbors. A proposed safe zone of Christians in the Nineveh area would, be, would only be secured 
if created in cooperation with the Muslims community in the region. This need, the approval of the Muslim communities for support at the local level is symbolic of the region-wide necessity for cooperation among different faith communities. An officially declared safe zone must function as an integral and cooperative component of the surrounding community. Over time, such an approach will help rebuild trust among Iraq's various religious and ethnic groups. What must be done concerning Lebanon? Lebanon is central to religious pluralism because it is both a symbolic and applied center, applied center of interface dialogue. For this reason, the international community has a fundamental interest in protecting Lebanon's national security, which acts as a shield for its positive internal dynamics. Lebanon is, in fact, the only Arab country which an intricate array of confessional communities that has not experienced widespread internal conflict. Therefore, it can and should serve as a springboard for a regional effort to protect and extend religious pluralism. In Lebanon and the Arab world generally, the two most pressing religious pluralism issues are, first, securing the status of Christians, and second, placing Sunni-Shia relations on a long-term peaceful footing in secure and confident Lebanon will certainly contribute to both tracks. I have already mentioned the important aid that the United States has provided to the Lebanese army. Other countries, such as Saudi Arabia and France, have been forthcoming with military assistance as well. But to secure Lebanon from attacks and infiltration by ISIS and other terrorists, more needs to, to be provided in terms of money, equipment, advisory personnel, and training. The consequences for Lebanon of the ongoing Syrian crisis have been tremendous. In January, an official with the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, told America's National Public Radio, and I quote, the international community has got to provide more support to Lebanon. They are totally overwhelmed. I mean, you imagine what it would be, what it, it would be like if one quarter of the US population were refugees. We estimate the number of refugees currently in Lebanon at between 1.2 to and 1.5 million. Even if the low estimates are accepted as valid, the fact is that one out of four people now residing in Lebanon is refugees. Translated into American terms, this would be the equivalent of hosting eight million, eight million desperate people in need of every possible necessity of life, from food, housing, education, employment, medical care. 80 million for the U.S. population, 8 million refugees. If the international community should do more to support Lebanon, then the Lebanese must demonstrate that they, ha they are worthy partners. I refer here to the embarrassing, counterproductive, self-defeating, and partially self-inflicted vacancy of the Lebanese presidency. You know that are unable to elect a president since 300 days. Simply put, the Lebanese system of shared powers among its various communities by definition cannot work if it's disrupted at the summit, where the Christian president, the Sunni Muslim prime minister, and the Shia Muslim parliamentary speaker are expected to provide individual and collective leadership. Lebanon needs a strong, capable, and experienced president who can engage three critical issues. First, reconciling internal Lebanese differences and contradictions through sustained dialogue. Second, 
coordinating government, governmental reforms and economic development, and third, serving as the voice of Lebanon within the international community by defending sovereignty and core national interests. What must be done on an international level? Ladies and gentlemen, I have spoken at length and wish to thank you sincerely for lending me this distinguished platform. I would like to conclude by sharing some thoughts about the need to promote concepts of democracy and human rights in the Arab world. These goals, of course, are related to, but broader than, the struggle to preserve religious pluralism. In this maelstrom, Arabs are confronted by three competing realities of governance. The old failed states, the so-called Islamic State, and what can be called citizen states. For some years, I have been discussing a concept that could help move the Arab world towards citizen states, a concept called the Arab Marshall Plan. This plan is not a detailed blueprint, but specified funding levels, metrics, and timetables. Rather, the Arab Marshall Plan is meant to be a moderate alternative that will encourage Arabs, especially Arab youth, to embrace democratic ideas as a prelude to democratic systems. Other priorities of the Arab Marshall Plan are physical reconstruction and economic development and the new systems of governance, both domestically and on the level of regional cooperation. One may ask, with the ramping force like ISIS on the loose, how can alternative like the Arab Marshall Plan succeed? In response, we must remember the advice given by the very French statesman Talleyrand to that great believer in military force, Napoleon. The only thing Napoleon Talleyrand said to Napoleon, and I quote, the only thing you cannot do with a bayonet is sit on it. <laughs> the only thing you cannot do with a bayonet is to sit on it. By, by this, he meant that the logic of power does not create legitimacy. The only basis for stable and long-term good, govern good governance is diplomacy. And also I say to those who support the best aspect of Arab civilization, civilization including religious pluralism, the ideological and actual bayonets of ISIS will fail. Can be sure it will, it will fail. Because of the same logic of Talleyrand. The mental, the mental and physical bayonets of an evil army will not frighten us. ISIS will not frighten us, will not intimidate us or deflect us from our goal of building freedom and dignity for Lebanon across the Arab world. Thank you. <laughs>